Melissa, does your organization interact with FORCE at all? Yes, we partner with FORCE um, and a lot of other organizations. And we're actually one of the CDC grantees. So we, oh, have, great. A lot of, yeah, we have a lot of connection with the other grantees. Excellent. Tammy, you're muted. So I'll just keep talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm sorry, I held, you know, we did it so last minute. And thank you uh, so much, Professor Yoshal Mirinat, for joining us. And we hope Miri uh, gets better soon. Uh, we're very excited about the event. Yeah, we'll start it in one minute, I think, because people seem to be joining us. Uh, we got quite a few questions in advance, so that's really nice on the different comments and everything. So, um, ah, and Vanina, you're here too. Great. Uh, and good to meet you, Melissa, also. We're actually, I, I, I know less, yeah, I've only uh, met Dr. Heckman's daughter before because. Uh, Very nice to meet you, thank you. Good to meet you. And again, thank you all for, uh, for doing this. Uh, well, should we, what is, uh, okay. Yeah, it's, uh, to, you know, everything uh, happens together. And usually uh, we tried in the past when we had a few things together, we tried to stack them or delay them or change the schedule. And then we found that it doesn't matter what day we choose or when we go, that day becomes very, uh, <laughs> Very, very full as well. So we just stopped, you know, trying to space things. So I'll just say it's um, uh, today is the uh, Hebrew by the Hebrew calendar. It's the anniversary of the assassination of uh, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. It's 25 years to the um, to the Hebrew day, uh, it, which is crazy to think about, you know, that it was 25 years ago. But we're also obviously doing uh, things, you know, lowering the flag to half staff putting up a remembrance table. So that took up a couple of minutes before I came here. It was a little longer than I, and we timed it. So sorry, but uh, I think we will start, right? Yes, sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's a very one, it's within uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, which is very important to us here, but it's a very uh, yeah, unique, I think, uh, day as well. Uh, but let me open up. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, and welcome uh, to our uh, Zoom or uh, webinar event uh, where we get to ask our experts, which I'll introduce in a moment, everything uh, we want to know or need to know or have questions about breast cancer in the context of, uh, of course, Breast Cancer Awareness, Awareness Month. I'm Tammy Benheim. I'm the Minister for Public Diplomacy here at the Embassy of Israel in Washington, D.C. And uh, I won't take a lot of time. Uh, we have here three amazing experts in the field, uh, which I feel very lucky uh, to be able to ask the questions that you guys sent out to us and some questions that we actually had in the department. So I'll just start with the introductions. Uh, we have Dr. Heckman Stoddard, uh, who received her Doctor of Philosophy degree in Molecular and Cellular Biology at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, focusing on mammary gland development and breast cancer. And then she joined the National Cancer Institute as a cancer prevention fellow. Uh, as a fellow, Dr. Heckman Stoddard completed a master's in public health in the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and completed research focused on drug development for breast cancer prevention and biomarker development. In 2011, she joined the National Cancer Institute Division of Cancer Prevention as a program director for the Breast Cancer Prevention Clinical Trials Grants Portfolio and scientific monitor of early phase breast cancer clinical trials within the NCI, the National Cancer Institute. In 2016, Dr. Heckman Stoddard became chief of the Breast and Gynecologic Cancer Research Center, overseeing staff to support prevention research for a range of women's cancers. Additionally, she serves as the Breast Cancer Project Scientist for CISNET, Cancer Intervention and Surveillance Modeling Network, as well as project scientists for examining cancer outcomes 
within the Diabetic Prevention Program Outcome Study. So uh, welcome, Dr. Heckman Stoddard, and thank you. Our next expert is from Israel, uh, Professor Rinati Ushalmi. Uh, she's an honors graduate from the Technion Bruce Rappaport Faculty of Medicine. Uh, Professor Yerushalmi has been a practicing medical oncologist since 1998, and she currently works at the Davidov Cancer Center in Bailinson Hospital with a focus on breast cancer patients. Since August of 2016, in addition to being part of the managerial team of the Davidov Cancer Center, she has headed the breast cancer unit uh, breast cancer unit, sorry, at the Institute, uh, at the Institute itself, sorry, okay, I, I misread that. At the Davidov Center, she, uh, she heads the unit of breast cancer uh, treatment. Professor Yoshami has published more than 60 scientific publications in peer-reviewed journals and has been awarded several national and international awards, including the AACR Scholar in Training for the Cure Award funded by Susan G. Komen. In January 2017, Professor Yerushalmi was appointed clinical associate professor at the Faculty of Medicine of Tel Aviv University. She is also the clinical director of the Breast Cancer Laboratory at the Felsenstein Medical Research Center in Tel Aviv University, which is part of the Sackler School of Medicine in the Rabin Medical Center. Hello, uh, Professor Yerushalmi. Hi. Uh, and our last uh, and final, uh, last but not least panelist is Melissa K. Rosen, uh, who is uh, Shalsheret, and hopefully you'll tell us a little bit about Shalsheret soon. She's the Director of Training and Education. She holds a master's degree in Jewish Communal Services from Brandeis University and has been working uh, in the nonprofit sector for over 30 years. Her professional experience includes informal education and programming, advocacy, and community outreach. Melissa's work has allowed her to facilitate unique and lasting connection among organizations in the diverse American Jewish community. Uh, she oversees community education throughout the country and she uh, works with training healthcare professionals. <clears throat> and she manages Sharsheret's support partnership program. Uh, as a two-time cancer survivor, she is passionate about the Jewish community and cancer support and advocacy. And as I said, we'll hear uh, more about what Shalshela does uh, in a little bit. Uh, so good morning again, or good afternoon, everybody. And thank you because um, as you know, we've had a, a couple of talks getting ready for this and preparing within the department and with our experts and in general. And I think it touches, uh, I can say all of us, because uh, you know all women at some point uh, get tested and go through this and we'll talk about this, but I think it doesn't just affect women because it affects uh, you know, your partners, your families, your friends, uh, you know, leading up to the test and getting tested and talking about it. And of course, if you find out that you do have cancer, it affects obviously your own life, but I think also the people around you. So I think it's really fair to say uh, that breast cancer, it's a woman's issue, but it's not uh, uh, just a women's issue. Uh, so if I can, if we can start um, just to make sure we're all on the same page, can we just start for a minute about talking uh, what breast cancer is in just a few uh, lay person's words, or you know, if there are different types or what exactly what's the disease that we're talking about today? Uh, could you start it off? Could you start us off, please, uh, Dr. Heckman Stoddard? I muted myself to avoid an echo. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm very honored to, to join you for, for this webinar. Um, so breast cancer simply is when cells in the breast grow out of control. And this can happen in the ducts of the breast and result in ductal cancers or in the glands of the breast that make milk and result in lobular cancers. Thank you. Uh, would you like to say some words, uh, Professor Wushanmi, from what you've countered? Are there different, uh, are there different types uh, of breast cancer, as we know there are for other types of cancer, or about the mutations, uh, the BRCA mutations? Right. So in general, we differentiate between three different subtypes. 
there are the there is the subtype with what we call estrogen estrogen receptor positive the tumor actually show us that it has receptors to estrogen and we use it to treat the patient this is one uh, subtype another subtype is the her2 positive subtype only 15% of the breast cancer patients uh, have an overexpression of the HER2 gene, HER2 protein, that allows us to use, again, to use this uh, receptor to treat the patients. There is a nasty, very nasty subtype. Fortunately, or, or also only 15% of the patients have this uh, subtype. It's called the triple negative breast cancer. Why is it triple negative? Because it's negative for estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2. So this is in general uh, the subtypes that we relate to. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that. Um, and uh, just to go in, because we said we, you know, talking about what we need to know even before um, what, uh, what would be like the first symptoms or why, you know, even maybe before I go get tested, what, uh, do I, or any woman need to look for, uh, or, you know, or what symptoms do we need to be aware of that may indicate that it's time to go get checked? Uh, Melissa or. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, I'm going to leave it to the doctors to talk about some, some of the more physical symptoms, but what I, what I would say is that um, the interesting thing about breast cancer is not only are we reactive, if we see a symptom, we go to the doctor, but we're being proactive as well. And that's an important distinction between breast cancer and some other illnesses out there. We have ways to check before symptoms arrive or arise. And, and that's critically important. And I, I think we may talk about this later a little bit more in depth, but um, for members of the Jewish community who may be at higher risk than the average population, it's important to know that the recommendations that are, are put out there that one might read on the news or, or, or hear on the news or read online may not be relevant for individuals within this community. And that there's a lot we can do with our healthcare team to create customized screening plans that we can we can um, take on before symptoms arrive or arise. And um, again, we can talk about how to create that customized screening plan later, but I do want to say that it's not just symptoms we're looking for, but we're going to be proactive too. And then I, I leave it to the doctors to talk about the physical symptoms. Would either of you like to add to this just uh, to get us started? Yeah, I agree with Melissa that today, with the early detection, actually most of the women will be asymptomatic, totally asymptomatic. So we don't wait for symptoms and uh, we just adhere to the screening program. And this is the best, uh, the best method. Because usually when you do see something, it means that it's, it's not an early detection, right? So it's, it's the best to adhere to the screening program that your country decided on. Uh, yeah, and we'll talk about, uh, as, as you all said, we'll go in a minute about, uh, you know, what are the screening systems and maybe the similarities and differences uh, between uh, the U.S. and Israel. But I just got a question, and then I guess, one, it's interesting what you said about the symptoms, and if it's not, if you already have symptoms, it's not, it's no longer early detection, which uh, I, I personally didn't make that uh, connection before, so thank you. But uh, somebody asked us, um, it, in the cases, in the when the symptoms have, what percentage of cases uh, come from family, from your hereditary or the gene, or you know how much is I guess goes through the families uh, of breast cancer? Like, what are your chances, I guess, of having breast cancer if you have it in your family? To put it simply. So, so I think that that question can be answered two ways, right? So, of all breast cancer. 
five to 10% is based on hereditary risk. And the other side of that question is, if I have familial risk, will I get cancer? What is my risk of getting cancer? And that's going to depend on what specific mutation you, your family has in its heritage. That, that makes, uh, that makes uh, sense to me. And uh, I'm sorry, it's okay. I hope that I'm putting in questions as, as I'm getting them as well. Uh, so it's not jumping around a little, um, but uh, we were asked questions that I don't know if we can still see it because it's only, it's been six or seven months, but since the pandemic or the coronavirus hit, is there suddenly a difference? Maybe uh, people's anxiety levels or stress regarding breast cancer, or are they actually not even thinking of getting tested or doing things with breast cancer? Either way, do we see any effect that the pandemic is having? Melissa? Um, well, I'm actually going to, I can talk about reducing stress during the pandemic, but I know that NCI specifically put out something that I quote very frequently to the audience I speak with. So let's go right to the source because they have some shocking information about how the pandemic has impacted screening and how they anticipated impacting uh, cancer mortality in the next uh -huh. decade. Uh, happily, Dr. Heckman Stoddard. Sure. So this was actually a, a project that was done by CISNET, that mathematical modeling uh, group where I serve as the project scientist. Um, and uh, Dr. Ned Sharpless, the head of the National Cancer Institute, came to that group and asked them to model what could potentially happen with cancer mortality because of the lack of cancer screening that um, could happen because of the pandemic, right? because both people, hospitals are shut down, not allowing screening to occur. And then the fear that once hospitals open back up and screening can occur, women will not return to their normal screening functions or they'll just think they can skip the screening that was missed during that time. Um, and so uh, I should pull up the exact data. Melissa, do, since you quote it so often, do you wanna go ahead? <laughs> So yeah, um, I, I, I believe that um, it indicated that in some parts of the United States, uh, routine screening, cancer screening is down as much as 90%. Wow. Right. And in addition, um, over the next uh, decade, they anticipate that, um, that, or they anticipate that cancer deaths, particularly breast and colon, I believe was what was quoted, that, um, that it will negatively impact for the next decade. It's not just gonna be during the, the duration of the pandemic, but because there were delays in screening and even changes to treatment plans early on, it will negatively impact. Um, and there may be an extra, I wanna say they quoted 10, 000, 10 to 20,000 deaths because of it. I'm not 100% sure of that number, but it will definitely negatively impact for the next decade. But what I, I, I did a presentation last night and what I said is it was very scary for us when we heard that routine screenings were being canceled from hospitals, but that's not the case anymore. The medical community has figured out how to keep us safe. And at this point, if you've missed a, a, a routine screening, whether it's a, a, a mammogram or a sonogram or an MRI or whatever you had planned, it's time to reschedule it. And, and assuming that one year won't make the difference is, is not an accurate assumption. The, the, the healthcare facilities know how to keep us safe at this point. So go ahead and pick up the phone and make that call to schedule. And this gets, this gets to um, Dr. Yerushalmi's um, point earlier that screening um, is the early detection, right? And so if you delay that screening, what you might end up with is symptoms that then cause you to go to the doctor and, and could result in the diagnosis of a breast cancer. So that screening is the most important part of this. Uh, and we'll get into it in a moment. I just want to ask uh, in Israel, Professor Yerushalmi, in Israel, there was also uh, this effect where either people did not show up for the screenings or hospitals had to uh, delay or reschedule. Uh, did we experience the same sort of uh, effects in Israel? 
Uh, yes, in the, especially in, in what we call the first wave of the COVID-19, lots of appointments were just canceled. People, uh, women got a phone call saying, don't come. Uh, today, it's the opposite way. The women get uh, phone calls, please come. No one was infected while doing a screening mammogram. No one was infecting, doing a, no BRCA patient uh, was harmed because she did the MRI, annual um, MRI. So uh, definitely it impacted Israel as well. Uh, though I think less, less than what I'm here from Melissa uh, description. Interesting. And if we're talking about outside factors such as growing up, are there, are there any outside uh, factors, exposures uh, that women do get exposed to that increase or may cause uh, breast cancer? It's a different issue. Yeah, yes, you know, uh, lifestyle is, is, was always uh, something that we need to, to make efforts to do, to do better. And it's still true, you know, obesity, uh, we know that obesity impact the risk of uh, developing breast cancer. Alcohol, we know that there is um, a, a correlation between the consumption of alcohol and the risk uh, being active or not being active. I mean, you can't go wrong. If you are, do, if you are exercise on a regular basis, you can't go wrong, right? Mm -hmm. uh, something quite interesting, I'm, I think that not men, I was surprised to find out that even smoking is correlated with breast cancer cancer. Uh, we correlate uh, smoking with lung cancer, head and neck cancers, uh, but also with breast cancer. So a uh, lifestyle, exercise, more exercise, don't smoke, don't, uh, don't drink alcohol, then probably it, it will do some good for you. That's interesting. And you also, you mentioned lifestyle, you mentioned obesity, and uh, we spoke with Dr. Heckman's daughter. Can you just uh, fill us in, because we also said in your bio about uh, the diabetes or the correlation between breast cancer and diabetes that you're doing uh, these days? Sure. So um, diabetes obviously is, is associated with obesity and obesity causes an increased risk, um, mostly of postmenopausal breast cancer. Um, although we have some uh, newer studies in the portfolio now that are actually looking at obesity as a modifier of even BRCA risk. Um, and, and how it might affect the, the penetrance of, of, of that risk. Um, so oh, diabetes does increase the risk of breast cancer just like obesity does. Um, and the study that I'm involved in looked at a lifestyle intervention and a drug called metformin, which is the first line treatment for diabetes and its ability to, um, originally the study was designed for the prevention of diabetes and both of those interventions very much showed that um, both of those interventions do prevent the development of diabetes. Um, and uh, we are looking at the long-term effects of those interventions on cancer risk. And so that, that study is still ongoing. Um, but, uh, you know, as uh, was mentioned, really, you know, being active um, and, we don't know for certain that actually, if you're already obese, reducing that obesity will decrease your risk. That is an open question, but it is good for overall health and for helping you feel better. Thank you for that. And I want to move on to detection issues, but we just got a question and I hope I'm reading it correctly. Uh, a, a participant asked if I have Fibro, fibrodenomas, benign tumors. I'm saying the word wrong and I'm sorry. This is what happens when you accept questions in that. Uh, do I have an increased risk for getting breast cancer? Is that something we can answer or just generally, is there a connection between benign tumors and breast cancer? So, uh, if I may answer, then fibroadenoma is a benign tumor. It's a benign tumor and normally People ask, can it be converted into a malignant one? Then normally, it's, if it's a benign, it's a benign. Sometimes there is a tiny area inside the fibroadenoma which is malignant. It's not that it, it was converted into malignancy, just you, who, it wasn't diagnosed initially. 
Uh, but what we know today that um, benign disease may increase the risk for future breast cancer. Not any benign disease. We should differentiate between proliferative benign disease and non-proliferative. Uh, so, so probably with your fibroadenoma, you are, you are, uh, it's not a problem, uh, but sometimes women are undergoing a biopsy and then it says it is a benign disease, but it has some atypical areas. Once there are atypical, the, the, you, you have the word atypical, it's something uh, that you should be concerned of and even think, discuss with your physician what can be done to reduce risk. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And Professor Jami, I'll just continue with you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the approach to early detection and what each woman from what age, you know, is expected to do in Israel? Like what age are you supposed to start yearly or bi-yearly uh, mammograms? Um, and sort of tell us what, the, what each woman in Israel does and then we'll compare it. Uh, we'll ask what's happening in the U.S. Okay, so in Israel, we have a very, um, a very good program that we are very proud of. It's actually uh, the Israeli Cancer Association, Association was initiated together with the Ministry of Health. And today there is adherence to the program of 72%, which is, I think it's quite impressive. Uh, you know, uh, when, when people went to vote to the prime minister, the adherence was around 60%. So, so I think it's quite interesting that 72% uh, of the women are going to do mammograms. Uh, in Israel also we have, it's, it's, um, it's something again, initiation of the Israeli Cancer uh, Organization, um, a, a mammogram, a mobile mammogram unit that goes every, everywhere. It, uh, today it can be in the north of the country and tomorrow it can be uh, at, the, um, at the south of the country. And so everyone gets mammogram and every, everyone uh, again adhere to it. And something that I would like also to, 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 to mention is that there is no difference between Arab women and Jewish women in terms of adherence. The only problem in Israel is the Orthodox Jews that they less adhere to the program. I guess we can work on that. Uh, but um, yes, that's what we have in Israel. And what what is the what is the recommendation after age forty or forty five oh, to get okay. tested yearly? So it's so it, it, the recommendation is to start in the with the, in the age of fifty, unless you have a family history, and then we start at the age of forty. Or if a patient is a BRCA, then you know there is there are international guidelines and you start with MRI at the age of 25, etc. Thank you. And in the US, is it uh, the same Dr. Heckman Stoddard? So the US is a mishmash of guidelines. <laughs> um, there are different organizations that put out guidelines for breast cancer screening. Um, the National Cancer Institute does not do guidelines. We took ourselves out of that business many years ago. Um, so our job is to do research that would inform the guidelines, but we ourselves do not put out guidelines. Um, the recommendation from the US Preventive Services Task Force um, was updated a few years ago based on the available research and that really, it's really, those are really only for normal risk women. They are not for high risk women. Um, so those recommend that between 40 and 50, you have a conversation with your doctor about your personal risk and make an informed choice about screening. And then after 50, um, biennial screening. Thank you for that. And uh, just to, can you tell us a bit about the reliability of the yearly test? Uh, whether the ultrasound, the mammogram, the differences, uh, people ask you how reliable it is and what, I guess, yeah, what the percentage of detection is. Um, so that is going to depend on the density of your breast. 
Um, so uh, dense breasts are a risk factor for breast cancer. And the more dense your breasts are, the harder it is for those tests to detect the cancer in them. And so that's why women with dense breasts are often um, given additional tests in addition to the mammogram. So they might have an ultrasound in addition to a mammogram if there are spots that um, are suspicious. Um, and so really the reliability of the test depends on how dense your breasts are. Thank you. And just another question for Professor Yoshami, and then I wanna ask Melissa something. Uh, somebody just asked us if uh, her mother, uh, you know, died of ovarian cancer, is there a link for her? Is she more susceptible to breast cancer? Okay, that's an excellent question. Uh, so in Ashkenazi Jews, I can tell you because 50% uh, uh, of the uh, population in Israel is Ashkenazi Jews. So in Ashkenazi, if, if a patient, a woman has a an ovarian cancer, and she is an Ashkenazi Jew, then the risk of being a BRCA carrier is around 30%, which is quite high. So 30 or even 40%. So uh, I don't know what is the origin of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the women who ask us the question, but definitely any ovarian cancer should be um, should be tested for BRCA, and if this was not happen, then uh, then uh, her daughter should be tested. Thank you, and uh, Melissa. So I think this might be a really good time to talk about how to create a customized screening plan. If you don't mind me adding a, a bit here, um, we talked about the recommendations, and of course, in both cases, you bo you both mentioned that's for women of average risk. And women of Ashkenazi descent are not considered of average risk. And, and the recommendations are, are just that. So what in, they're just recommendations. So what, what can you do? What information do you need to bring to your doctor to have a good conversation to create an informed screening plan? So you should be talking to your family members about the cancer history in your family. And not just breast cancer and not just ovarian cancer but any cancer. We now know that BRCA mutations don't just heighten the risk for breast and ovarian cancer, but also for pancreatic, for melanoma, for prostate, for male breast cancer. There are other mutations that raise risk for breast or ovarian cancer that are also connected to colon cancer and, and, and other cancers. So you want all cancers and you also wanna get the age of onset if you know that because we're less worried about cancers that happen in the 60s, 70s, and 80s than we are about cancers that happen in younger people. And again, not just your mother's side, but your father's side as well, because BRCA mutations happen in equal numbers in male and males and females. And, and by the way, they pass those mutations down in equal numbers to male and female children. So your entire family's cancer history, whatever you can get, as well as your own, your own health history. Um, your doctor will take into consideration, ha have you had any treatments that may um, increase your risk? Do you have dense breasts and other things like that? And then you'll create a customized screening plan, which may be, you know, your risk is average and you can follow recommendations, or it may be we want to start earlier or we want to test you, screen you differently. You also need a sonogram with your mammogram, or maybe you need MRIs instead. And, and so all of those things go into, and go into and inform a customized screening plan, which I really encourage everyone to get. Thank you for that. It's very important. And Going from screening a little bit, uh, and can you tell us, uh, maybe we'll start with, uh, with Professor Shami Israel, what uh, percentage of women are detected in time and what, is there a cure? What are the percentages now of women who are able to overcome uh, breast cancer or live with breast cancer? If you can talk to us a little bit about, uh, about that. Okay, in Israel, like in many other countries, we have a registry quite a good one. And we know that only 3% of the breast cancer patients appear with what we call stage four presentation, present with metastasis 
at the, the, date, the day of diagnosis. So 97, 97% of the population that is diagnosed with breast cancer are actually offered treatment for cure. Unfortunately, we can't cure everyone, but when we talk about five years, uh, five years survival, then the five year survival is 94% uh, uh, for Jewish and a little bit less for Arab women. Uh, and if we talk about, about 15 per, uh, years of survival, then it's around 80%. So um, most of the women can be cured. Okay, and what are the numbers in the US? Do either Dr. Hoffman started or Melissa? I, I in turn. No, no, go ahead. I'm going to defer to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Would it be more or less the same for 50 years, 80% or? Um, so the, it, it, it's gonna, the, so it depends on, on how you define. So it, in the US, we've started to talk about screen detective cancers versus interval cancers. And that interval cancer is the cancer that comes in between your screening that is missed. And it, we've found that the data show that those cancers tend to be worse than cancers that are detected by screening. Um, and Both so- Both are breast I, cancer. You're talking about breast cancer and either just different- Breast, breast cancer, right. So, so breast cancer that's detected by a screen versus breast cancer that maybe was a lump or was, was a result of nipple discharge where you went to the doctor with a symptom that resulted in your cancer diagnosis. And so that is why Melissa's point about these individual screening plans is so incredibly important um, because you want your cancer to be detected by screening. Interesting. Um but can we just elaborate on that for a second? Because uh, so basically what we're saying, we spoke about symptoms and symptoms actually not being early detection anymore. Even if I'm in that group that needs to go and get screened, whether a mammogram or sonogram or both once a year, this doesn't exempt me for the rest of the year until I go get tested again. Is this, this is basically what you're saying. I do need what the self test each month or to just- Well, you just need to pay attention to your body. Right. So if you have breast pain or you have nipple discharge and that is odd for you, if it is different than what you normally feel, then you should talk to your doctor. Absolutely. You know, we all know that lumps may be a symptom of breast cancer. And let me just say that most are not. They certainly, you know, are worthy of a, a visit to the doctor. But if someone does find a lump, please don't panic. There are many other things it could be. But I do want to point out, in addition, there are other symptoms, right? So you mentioned discharge. There's also change in skin texture or, um, or um, a rash or redness. There could be, um, there could also be, it's not only just what we consider the breast. It could be right above, right below, or in the axilla or armpit area. So different things to keep in mind if someone does find a symptom. Thank you. Uh, Professor Rishadmi in Israel, we speak about mammograms, we speak about cures. Uh, is there a technology, whether for detection or for treating or uh, new research that is being done that you can share with us? around breast cancer? So, um, you know, the MRI is considered the queen of the test. So there, there are problems with MRI. A lot of women want the test because it's without radiation, but the, the main problem with MRI is the high false positive rate. What does it mean? It means that uh, it says something is wrong, and then the patient is sent to, to have a biopsy, and actually nothing uh, was there. It was just, you know, um, alarm that shouldn't have been. So uh, there is, So we have in Israel uh, someone, a scientist called Adas Adgani. She, she has a, a technique of a diffusion 
MRI, not with gadolinium. Another problem with, um, with um, uh, the MRI is that you have to inject gadolinium. We, we don't know if it's totally safe. We know that the gadolinium penetrates the, uh, into the brain. Uh, so we have data that's safe, but maybe in 10 years, it, someone will say different, differently. So um, there aren't uh, MRI uh, mod techniques that without gadolinium based on diffusion. I must uh, emphasize that it's still investigational. Uh, the standard of care is still mammogram, ultrasound, and MRI for high-risk patients. Thank you uh, for that. Uh, we had uh, two, uh, two questions here that are semi-related, I think, but it's interesting about uh, percentages. Both of, do men get breast cancer and then what percent? And also we were asked about transgenders and breast cancer, if there are data, if any of you can uh, deal with, uh, can answer either one. So men do get breast cancer, um, mostly through the hereditary pathway. So um, it is it is rare, but it is um, associated with the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, which we've talked a lot about. Um, uh, just finding my numbers so that I can be specific. Um, so for men, the, the risk, um, with BRCA2 is higher than it is for, for BRCA1. Um, and, and it's very rare that men would get sporadic breast cancer not associated with, with a hereditary yes. mutation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And I have a question. It's to all of you, but uh, especially to Professor Yoshani, because in Israel, they used to say uh, that one in nine women uh, would get breast cancer. There was about 20 years ago, also an organization that started one in nine, it was called, right? The Hat Mitesha. Um, when doing research for this and, and talking uh, to you know our experts before, I understood the numbers are now it's one in eight. Is there a shift? Is there a change in the and why in the number of women that get breast cancer? Okay, so uh, some would say even that the ratio is one to seven point five or something, but it's in a lifetime, you know, until the age of one hundred and twenty. So. Uh, I think one of the reasons is that we uh, detect more. We have, uh, as I said, adherence to the screening so as a screening plan, and uh, women do it and detect more breast cancers. Uh, probably there are things that we don't know really, uh, maybe lifestyle that was changed. For example, what, we, what I can say about specific about the population in Israel, the Arab population used to have a very low uh, incidence of breast cancer. Once they became more adapted the Western lifestyle, we can see now more and more uh, uh, events of new breast cancer in the Arab population and probably because they adopted the Western uh, uh, lifestyle like a uh, uh, first birth, uh, giving birth at, at a later age, uh, less, be, uh, less active life, uh, all kinds of things like this, changing the food. Um, so, um, so probably lifestyle is always important. This is very similar to um, studies of immigrant populations in the US with the first generation mm -hmm. having similar risks to their home country and then the second generation having similar risk to the base US population. Interesting. And the numbers in the US then would be the same as in Israel? Uh, what was it, one in seven and a half or one in eight women throughout? Yes, the yep, one in, one in eight is the, the same um, rate that is uh, quoted commonly in the US. Um, Okay, uh, we got uh, one more question because we're almost out of time. So I'll do this quick. I have a question, but we have one more question similar to the ovarian cancer one. I think 
Uh, somebody just asked if they have in their family pancreatic cancer. Would there be any connection or? I think Melissa answered it before when yeah, she said. There might be, there might be. It used to be when a doctor asked, do you have, do you have a, a history of breast cancer in your family? That's what they would use as a determining factor. Now we know that's not true. Uh, uh, pancreatic, prostate, melanoma, male breast cancer, ovarian and breast, they're all related. So you could have throughout your family, no duplicates, but, all, but people having each of those cancers and it would still be considered high risk. Yeah, so I'll just repeat what I understood and correct me if I'm wrong, that every woman should go to her doctor and just basically list any disease she thinks may be relevant and talk to him or her. And then for each and every woman here, maybe this is the takeaway, you know, go and do it, whether you have or don't have, or you thought it wasn't relevant, just go and figure out what should be your screening uh, protocol, what you should be doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Tammy, can I just make one point about that? Because we recently did a study of primary care physicians across the U.S., and very many of them do not understand cancer risk very well. So if you're having a conversation with your doctor and you do not feel like they are giving you information that seems correct, there are many other places in the U.S. for you to have that conversation there are high risk clinics all over that if you have a family history, they are excellent places to go and discuss your risk. Absolutely. And a genetic counselor is a great place to go, even in addition to a doctor. Um, yeah, absolutely. The field of genetics changes so rapidly that unless you're a genetic counselor or you've taken a special interest, um, Yes, we often have women that come to us that say, but my doctor told me I didn't need genetic screening because all the cancer was on my father's side of the family and things like that. So high risk clinic, genetic counselor, definitely um, the way to go if you have concerns. Thank you. Um, and now uh, if I can just, uh, I'll go with each one and maybe we'll just start with uh, Melissa Rosen and as you had the last word, can you give us one or two sentences or thoughts uh, in conclusion? Absolutely. So we've talked a lot about pre being proactive. And so I don't want to say any more about that because I want to get something else in, but being proactive is incredibly important. So we talked today about the physical aspects of breast cancer, and it is a physical disease. Absolutely. But there's also very strong psychosocial or emotional component to a cancer diagnosis and for some even a spiritual component. And we know study after study has proven that patients whose non-medical needs are met have better medical outcomes. And so for someone who's been diagnosed, you can't ignore the emotional component of a diagnosis of treatment. And that's where organizations like Shar Sherrett come in providing free psychosocial support to help women and their families navigate the cancer experience and um, address the needs that happen throughout the different stages of cancer, pre-diagnosis, diagnostic treatment, metastatic survivorship. And um, I, I just wanna encourage, if you know someone who could use additional support, um, can't forget that aspect. It's just as important as the physical aspects of treatment and healing. Thank you for that. Yeah, you're right. It's, yeah, and we, I think we're all, I think the things you're saying resonate to all of us these days, especially, you know, with dealing uh, also with the pandemic. We definitely, there is the physical disease side, but we definitely, and yeah, I think it's probably even more. And thank Absolutely. you for sharing that. Uh, Professor Yoshalmi. Um, some, well, Melissa said it so, uh, you know, she was perfect, so I have really nothing to add. I just um, would like to, to ask everyone to take care, uh, stay healthy uh, from the COVID and from other uh, problems. Um, this is my message. Thank you. Absolutely. And finally, uh, Dr. Heckman Stoddard. Thank you so much. So I, can I just take one second because the, the question about transgender came back up in the chat box and I, since they put it back in there, I don't want to ignore it. 
Um, there, there is nothing definitive in this space at this point. And so I think that's why we all didn't really answer it. But I do want to let you know that there is a lot of research going on in this area, um, particularly by organizations such as the Susan Love Foundation um, and the Army of Women, where there are studies you can participate in, in terms of uh, potential risk and creating cohorts to, to study how um, that process may affect cancer risk in the future. Um, and I guess being at the NCI, maybe that's my ending message is that participating in research is an incredibly important part of moving the treatment and uh, prevention and screening of breast cancer forward. And so um, we talked about new screening techniques or, um, you know, new treatments, if you're diagnosed, participating in clinical research or clinical trials is an important part of moving breast cancer forward and being able to treat future people with breast cancer um, more effectively. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, let me again thank our, our three panelists, Melissa K. Rosen from Shalsheret, Dr. Heckman's daughter from the National Cancer Institute and uh, Professor Yerushalmi from Tel Aviv University and uh, Bailingson Hospital. Um, I think, yeah, we covered a lot of ground and a lot of topics and I, I hope uh, people were able uh, to take some uh, thoughts and information away. We will also be sending out, um, you know, letters to everybody who participated and signed up with uh, the different links and, uh, you know, hyperlinks so you can know where to continue and get information or contact uh, the relevant organization who we spoke with today. Uh, and also, I want to say a big thank you uh, to Hadassah, uh, Hadassah Women's Organization of Greater Washington for partnering with us as well and helping us. And, uh, you know, please also follow us. We will have also all the information on our website, Israel in the USA. We'll have it on our different platforms as well. I think this was really important and um, I think it was a great and informative uh, and a, in the subway moving for me to weigh, uh, you know, to um, be part of uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So thank you all for joining us and yeah, and stay safe. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.